Hello. Hi. How's it going? <laughs> nice to see you all. Come join us. Don't be shy. All right. Welcome to the New Yorker world. We are here. <laughs> um, my name is Amy Kurzweil. I'm moderating this panel, subbing in for Sophia Warren, who's sick. And we have a whole team of subs here. <laughs> this is the sub universe. Yeah. Everyone put your hands together for the subs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Class>? yeah. <laughs> so uh, the way this is going to work is we're just going to introduce ourselves one by one and show you some of our work and talk about what we do in addition to New Yorker cartoons. Because I think what's beautiful about people who do cartoons um, single panel cartoons is that we all come at it from really different perspectives and the rest of our work looks different, how we got into it looks different. It's like a, a place where people are drawn from all different universes. So we'll tell you a little bit about that each and then we're just going to have a conversation about our practice and, and sort of what draws us to it, what we love about it, what the challenges are, and then I'll invite you to ask us questions as well. So we're going to start with Hi, everybody. <laughs> My name is Lonnie. I have a clicker that I've never used. Um, and these are my cartoons. Um, I've been doing New Yorker cartoons since. Uh, 2018. Um, I've been doing single panel cartoons before that and putting out the books since 2011. Um, I was inspired to do, to put out books because I thought that I could do better than some that I saw on the shelves <laughs> in the store. And, and so I, I gave it a try, uh, self published in 2009. I've given myself, myself a goal since 2006 to finish publishing stuff by 2009, and I did it in, in December of 2009, so it did happen. So, um, so um, I'll go slowly through the thousands of cartoons that I have here. Um, here's the next one. Uh, this was in the magazine fairly recently. Um, I, I do, this was inspired by tennis, I do like to play tennis. And, that's where all my tennis balls end up. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, over the years when I was doing the single panel cartoons, uh, I submitted to the New Yorker, like I said, in 2018, and they were aware of my work a little bit already, and suggested a couple of notes, and I was able to get into the magazine in about three weeks. <laughs> so it was a very tough road. <laughs> you know, that left to be weeks was hell. <laughs> so, but I've been doing cartoons for you know twenty years, so you know I, I paid my dues. You know, um, and I I am the guy. Not that this is one of them, but uh, um, I'm the guy that has a lot of dog cartoons in, in the New Yorker magazine. Although I, most of the cartoons I submit are cartoons with people. So, I, I don't own a dog. <laughs> but, but, you know, I guess I can relate. <laughs> so, the next one, I like hot dogs. Um, you know, my girlfriend Crystal here believes that you can't put ketchup on hot dogs. The, uh, is there anyone? With that, and, and with that. Okay. so I believe mustard and ketchup. I see people are disagreeing with me, but you know. <laughs> so we'll move on. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of the cartoons I do, I try to refer to New York in the background a little bit, you know, as far as the silhouettes of the buildings and stuff like that. So. Thank you. Thank you for ever to draw those. 
was called. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so much work. Uh, we'll move on. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was going to There's the dogs again. Um, you know, they're not the same dogs all the time. So I just think that all dogs think similarly. But um, yeah, they, these are not the same two everywhere all the time. I just, uh, just like to draw, draw the twos, I guess.
I'd like to finish something in less than eight years. So that's how I got into it. Yeah, yeah. So that's how I got into single family cartooning. But this, this is a graphic memoir about three generations of women in my family. I have two copies left if you, you know, want to come check it out. And then this is the first cartoon I sold to the New Yorker. So self-driving car, self-conscious car, what I look better in red, and self-actualized car. I'm going back to school. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of my cartoons are about technology, um, something I think about a lot, and also about the art world and the creative world. <laughs> this is Executive MFA, the poetry of PowerPoint, <laughs> which is what we're doing right now. <laughs> this is a poetry reading. I got an MFA in fiction writing, so I always wanted to be a writer, and I, I'm more of a self-taught drawer, and um, also self-taught PowerPoint figure. Books. 3 p.m., meet the author. 3.10 p.m., tweet negative reviews at the author. 3.30 p.m., meet the author's disappointed parents. 3.30 p.m., meet the author's spouse who has raised the author's children on a single earner's salary. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's happening at 3.40? Yeah. <laughs> That's when I quit. Yeah. Um, yeah, this was inspired by publishing a book. <laughs> if you give a mouse a French cookie, and suddenly the memory returns, the taste was that of the little crumb of Madeleine which on Sunday morning sat down, 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 down. So, most of you don't understand this cartoon, which is perfectly fine. If you get it, you've read Proust. Yeah. Okay. So, unfortunately I did read Proust in grad school, but I have not read If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. <laughs> I know, I've heard great things, it's on my list, okay? <laughs> Where the wild things summer. <laughs> I, like, uh, I like to reference literature and art in my, in my cartoons. This is a Grandma Digest. Who called, who never calls? Fun quiz, when are you getting married? What's in the freezer? It's half a loaf of rye bread. Top 10 pieces of furniture to wrap in plastic. <laughs> that is? <laughs> yes, oh my god, yes. I see, this is my grandmother. Um, she's the star of my first book. And so I've, I've done a lot of you know, stuff about her, but then I wanted to get her into The New Yorker, so it was very exciting to get her in there. But she doesn't wrap her furniture in plastic. She wraps her furniture in towels. And sheets. Wow. Softer. Okay. Smart. Yeah. Okay. You're telling me I should leave the artist commune that saved me from my stepmother's tyrannical elitism where I have seven boyfriends to become the impotent figurehead of another unjust power structure? <laughs> Uh, essays about technology. And then my book, which came out uh, this year, 
artificial, a love story is a graphic memoir about a technological invention of my father's, which was to, um, using my grandfather's archives, create this chatbot that writes in my grandfather's voice. Mm -hmm. So some of the tech themes that, you're, that you see in my New Yorker cartoons do come from having thought and spent a lot of time with technology. Uh, so that's a, that's a peek behind the curtain of what I do outside of New Yorker cartoons. Oh, and I also teach cartoon classes on Patreon. So if anybody is interested in cartooning, wants to learn more about it, I do a monthly class. It's really fun. So you're free to join me there. That's, that's it. That's what I got.
Okay, I'm just going to say it. The Justice League only gets together during catastrophes. We do not have enough time to discuss and vote on a budget during catastrophes. Um, this is the most recent thing I got into the magazine, and it absolutely, I didn't think they would select it, because it's basically fan art for DC Comics, which could be a good segue to saying that I do work for DC. <laughs> and all I have left at table W86 are my comics for DC, so you should definitely check them out. I don't know, do I have any more left here? Oh, other than single gags for The New Yorker, I have uh, done one, I guess, sketchbook, no, comic strip for uh, the magazine that came out in the cartooning issue. It was called Sunday, Sunday in the, I called it Sunday in the Park with Elmo, but they called it Sunday in Times Square with Elmo. Um, and it's probably the most serious thing I've written for The New Yorker, and definitely the only autobiographical thing. And they did let me say the word, the F-U-C-K word. Can I just, they said, I, could, I got to say fuck you, Elmo, um, <laughs> in The New Yorker. <laughs> you can bleep that out. So definitely check it out, you can find it still on the magazine. Um, and this is what I, yeah, so it's really interesting because I do work in black and white and single gag strips, but I mostly do graphic novels. Um, and these are my most recent uh, graphic novels. So yeah, I think that's all I got. Yes. I'm coming not from JV, I'm coming from the freshman team. No. I, got, I got pulled up real far. <laughs> uh, I think it was Thank two you. hours ago. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my name is Emma Hunsinger. Um, I actually submitted my first New Yorker cartoon when I was 12 years old. Yeah, I had um, it with my dad encouraged me to do it, and I was like, I don't know, the only thing my only reference points at that point were like school and church so I made a cartoon of a dove holding a chainsaw like chainsawing off a branch of a tree and it was like how the dove got the olive branch it made no sense it made no sense to anybody except I guess my dad who to this day still thinks it's hilarious so the first cartoon went in when I was 12 I got rejected and then I took a 13 year hiatus after that I started submitting again uh, when I was 25. Um, and it took me about a year and a half, I think, to actually sell one to uh, The New Yorker. This is my first one, Amy, I'm so sorry, but I can't <laughs> read that part. I, I subbed in so last minute that I forgot my glasses. I've seen your boyfriend back in my day. He wanted to talk to your boyfriend, he had to shout his name off the cliff. I would see every night for months until a naval officer came to your house to tell you he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Another one captured. Um, it was really exciting to sell my first New Yorker cartoon. I had I loved New Yorker cartoons like my whole childhood. I got the like big book of New Yorker cartoons that had cartoons from the 1920s till the current day. And I remember when I was a kid reading it. It like it I was up until 1960, I didn't understand anything, <laughs> but I still loved them. Um, this is uh, the, I think this is the second one I submitted. I also can't read it. I'm so sorry, Amy, you don't have to. We've got a 417K in progress. Suspect is a two-foot Victorian era American girl doll accessorized with a plaid frock. Matching bow, Black Mary James, and a nine-inch hay bar. Hay bar. <laughs> hay bar. <laughs> I was friends with a lot of hunters in college, so hay bar entered my vocabulary. <laughs> um, this one I I can remember the caption of. This is God meeting Adam. He says, "Do you think seventy-five percent water is too juicy?" <laughs> <laughs> I know, I was shocked by it. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I know, it's like, I, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but like, juicy, the word juicy is why I said this. Um, and I'm sure we'll also talk about how you learn about how you sold a New Yorker cartoon, uh, yeah. which is a very sort of strange email. It's usually just the subject line that says, okay. 
And then in the body, it'll say something like describing which con which cartoon it was you sold. So I think I got subject line okay. Opened up the email, and the body just said juicy. <laughs> Okay, juicy. <laughs> um, I also did shouts and murmurs for the New Yorker for the website. This one is my favorite. It's called Dentist Day Off, and it's the dentist <laughs> walking around and just being reminded of his work as a dentist. Um, uh, and I, after I was like selling stuff to the New Yorker, I was like, I'm a professional cartoonist technically, right? This is a big publication that I'm in, but I don't feel like I'm that good at drawing. So I decided to go to cartoon school uh, in Vermont. I went to the Center for Cartoon Studies, and while I was there, we got a nonfiction assignment where we had to write a nonfiction comic, and I wrote a nonfiction comic called How to Draw a Horse, that I then submitted to the New Yorker, they ran it, and it, it did very well on their website, and it led me to where I am now, which is my new book that came out a month ago called How It All Ends. It's sort of, um, uh, after this came out, it's about like being in seventh grade and having my first crush, and all of these middle grade graphic novel editors were like, I noticed your protagonist was 13 years old, do you think you could do middle grade? So. I went from here, oops, no, not to there, to here. And um, I actually haven't submitted gag cartoons to the New Yorker for a while because doing this takes a very, very long time. And as I'm sure we'll talk about, I feel like gags is a lifestyle. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like really hard to switch between the two. So that's me. I'll pass this back to you. So I guess the first question I want to ask before we get into like more process stuff is what do you think, okay, so when I was in grad school my for writing, my teacher was like, you're a really good writer, but you have too many ideas, which I think sounds like a compliment, but it was not a compliment. She was like, there's too much going on, like, like you got to focus. And then I realized later, like, that's why I'm a single panel cartoonist, like, I just like having a place where I can just finish an idea, just the idea, it's done. And that really suits my brain. And I'm curious if you could talk a bit about how single panel cartooning suits your brain in particular. What do you think it is about your brain or your body or anything you want to say about like how it suits you personally? Yeah. Funny drawing 
So I think, like, I love thinking in images, and I love having just that little bit of text there at the bottom, too, because just image is also hard. Um, yeah, that's what I really love about GAD cartoons. So I've always been like a goofy kid, uh, goofy looking, goofy acting, and you guys supposed to laugh at that, but <laughs> everyone was like, I identify. <laughs> no, but so I've always been like a really silly kid. But it's funny because in my like comic work, I really enjoy like narrative you know, with like drama and like huge cast and big backgrounds. Um, and you know it's it's fun to draw silly uh, to draw silly things, um, and but it's really hard to have a like a story that is like a young adult graphic novel have a lot of just like just separate humor pieces, um, and I also do some stand up as well. Like I, I have a humor part of me that just needs to like get out. I need to be silly. Like I need to make jokes. So when I'm coming up, when I'm noticing things or observing things that I find really strange or like just odd or funny or fascinating, sometimes that can come out as a joke in stand-up. And sometimes when you tell that joke on the stage, people don't laugh, and then I go, ah, this should be a single gag. <laughs> I, can, I can actually draw the details. So I think there's just different things you can communicate. Like I notice that if it's something more personal to me, that might be as a joke on stage, mm -hmm. but if it's something that's more universal or really abstract, mm -hmm. and you know, I don't have enough time to get everyone to like get in on this weird idea, I can just draw it. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a, I, I have no idea how I, how I would talk about like, oh, what if there was a CEO and he had like three dollar bills and he chose <laughs> one and you got to be CEO. <laughs> but if I draw that, people will understand like how ridiculous it is. So. It's like just um, almost like different instruments for humor, maybe. Great, yeah, because yeah, it's like a little bit more immediate space. Yes. You can like jump into the world so much faster. There's not as much setup, and it, it's um, yeah, it's like it's so immediate, and you don't have to worry about uh, maybe getting the joke wrong or people not understanding or them not laughing uh, <laughs> in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> Stand-up comedy is always, there's an awareness of the off. You can't get away from it. And like, your comedy has to be about you because you're a part of it. And there's something really universal about a single panel. Like, you don't get enough time with one cartoon to really plunge yourself into the world of the creator and the way you do in a comic. So there's like a little bit tense towards that universality. Although, of course, over a body of work, right, people develop their their individual voice, their individual line. Yeah. It's interesting because like Charles Adams is like, a really good example of someone who you kind of saw pieces of the Adams family and his single guy cartoons from mm -hmm. New Yorker, but he was like building this entire world. Mm -hmm. um, but still, you can still see each single guy cartoon and laugh at them separately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they last them all. You know, yeah. they're, they're timeless. The last mm -hmm. now, or what they were then, and what they will be. Mm -hmm. Except for all the ones that the well, yeah. <laughs> although it's just like the joke is that the woman's dress is going to no. fall down. Yeah. <laughs> that joke shows up so much. That's all the theater I know. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we can talk about that actually a little bit. I mean, did you grow up thinking The New Yorker was accessible to you? Like, I, I mean, all the cartoonists were white men when I was even a kid, which like, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, you know? Like, it, it's really changed in the last 10, five to 10 years that not white men have been able to get cartoons into the New Yorker. So do you like, did you grow up thinking that cartooning for the New Yorker was something you thought you'd do? And when did that start to change and why? Um, yeah.
Yeah, it's too, it was too lofty. You know, I, I didn't, you know, mm -hmm. I, why could I ever think that could happen? Mm -hmm. I was happy with doing my books. <laughs> but then I got that, that's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess I can answer the question that you it's weird because like I had always been aware of the New Yorker, but it wasn't something that was in our household. So it's strange. It wasn't that it was inaccessible, but I think I wasn't, I don't think I was aware that it was something that I not could do, maybe even should do. Cause I think I was more obsessed with like reading, like, I don't know, Garfield and Peanuts and um, like Spider-Man and like the like newspaper every every morning or every week. Um, so yeah, and I think the most interesting thing is that like there are so many more, there's so many more diverse voices, and I think there was actually a study done showing like the speaking characters in the New Yorker cartoons. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of them are animals. Um, <laughs> and I have, you know, literally, I have a cat. I have like a billion, a billion cats. Um, that could be, who, who knows why, it could be, like, you can project easily onto an animal, but there was very few characters of color speaking, actually with speaking roles. You might see a lot of characters, um, like, kind of, like, ancillary, like, by the side while, like, a white person spoke, mm -hmm. but I feel like that has started to change in uh, recent mm -hmm. comics, and, yeah, I mean, maybe that's one reason why. I was just like, I don't know, no one's, no one, like, me is saying anything. Yeah. And even if you notice in my comics, like I actively try to make other than when it's like two white guys talking about dollar bills. <laughs> I actively try to make uh, every character black. Even in the um, Justice League cartoon, it's a uh, John Stewart Green Lantern, <laughs> so, yeah. who canonically would say something like that. <laughs> I think one of the things for me growing up is that my mom was a huge Roz Chass fan. Mm -hmm. So like I grew up not just with like a female cartoonist role model, but like Roz Chass, like a really, really unique like female cartoonist. So I think, yeah, for me it felt doable because I was like, she's not just making your cartoon, she's making like her own special style. And so like if, if people can buy into this like super unique cartooning, like maybe one day I could, I think for me, like ability was, was the thing that I thought would never happen. Like I never thought I was good enough to at drawing to get into the New Yorker and I didn't think I would ever pursue it. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I think that was one of my main barriers. It feels like not an accident that Roz Chass has such a unique voice and is also like one of the few early women that she's like, well, I'm, you know, I have a different perspective and I think that's part of what made her so popular is that she just like created this, this line and this world of characters that's really, really her own. Um, all right, let's get into talking about process how we come up with ideas, not the classic where do you get your ideas question, but like how, like what are your techniques, what's your rhythm, when you're in, I know we all don't submit all the time, right, because we have other things going on, but um, when you're submitting, like how do you get to that space? Um, I will answer first by saying I keep a lot of lists and um, write down funny things that I observe, but then I'll just sit down at my desk and like just squeeze out like six cartoons in a day. And I'm always really amazed that I'm able to do it. It's like a great confidence boost, you know, yeah. that I can just like not eat all day and just be like, ah, I just like vomit cartoons, you know. <laughs> but I feel like it's like I'm building up this, like, I'm not going to get too far with like the body yeah. metaphor, but um, I'm building up this sort of like backlog of, of like cartoons and then I just kind of but I don't, I'm not saying that's like the right way to do it. That's just how my lifestyle ends up presenting itself as my rhythm with cartoons. And so I'd love to hear your, your um, strategies and rhythms with you know, how, you, how you get to a batch. And, and for people who don't know, a batch of cartoons is what we submit, ideally once a week, but for sure we're not actually doing it once a week, that's way too much. But a batch could be like five to 10 cartoons. And you send it to the editor and then see, you know, you wait 
and see if you get the okay. And hopefully it's a juicy okay. <laughs> 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 um, I can say for me, okay, I, I had, I was doing that, the same thing of just like trying to sit down and come up with cartoons. I'm pretty bad at that actually. But then I took Asher Corlin's workshop. Mm. Um, oh, and Asher, one of my students. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. See? I taught him everything you know. I'm like, so I'm your grand student. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Asher um, also works for, I think he still works for the Colbert, uh, the late show with the Stephen Colbert. And he talks about how he does morning pages. Did we get that from you? Well, he got it from the artist's way. Yeah, he got it yeah. from the artist's way. Yeah. Um, but I've never seen someone apply morning pages to a single guy cartoon. Yeah. He's very scientific about it, about talking about just getting all the emotions out, then going through and highlighting high emotions, and just seeing, because that's like kind of the genesis of all humor, just something that you feel strongly about. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he, he literally gave like scientific tips, like, all right, if you have an idea and you really want to push it, uh, you can put it in heaven or you can put it in hell. Uh, <laughs> I was like, um, and honestly, that's kind of what I've been doing. I try to have, just make a bunch of observations and then put some, do a little bit of that science to yes. it. Science. Uh, I don't have any science. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, so my plan, you know, we submit, uh, it needs to be in my, what, Tuesdays, the noon Eastern. <laughs> my plan on Wednesday, the day after, is to do the day, uh, and, 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 you know, be all ready by Monday and submit, you know, that and I will be. But normally what happens is that I start drawing at 11 p.m. the night before. <laughs> And I don't mean to, and you know, I have witnesses. <laughs> you know, and, and it's very frustrating stuff comes up and takes up time, and then I'm like, you know, I'm not going to submit. Oh, yes, I am. And, and so then I start drawing, and usually I'm up until five in the morning, yeah. Pacific time, you know, I'm trying to be Eastern time. Right? Okay. And, and, but, and they're all fully finished, whatever I submit. Um, uh, usually five, maybe three and two resubmissions, you know, that kind of thing. But um, that's sort of my weekly process. I still draw like a little kid on my stomach, you know. What? You know, you yeah. On your stomach? Yeah, you know, just like a, you, when you used to be on the living room floor, I still draw like that. How are you? That's so good. It actually feels better than sitting, you know, and, and yeah, I just wow. use a couple of pillows and draw. <laughs> Yeah, mine's like 200 for two years. 
I don't know, like goofy, maybe more mm -hmm. like phantomy, because mm -hmm. that's that's what I love. And I realized that like that's just is is that fair to say that there's like yes. a certain audience? That yeah. Is <laughs> so, but I think the audience is changing with the internet. Yeah. Okay. So I feel that the change with like authorship, the change with more diversity, with younger people, with like it feels like that does coincide with this genre having a wider reach beyond just people who subscribe to The New Yorker. So I feel like it's it's changing in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's let's take some other questions and we'll come back if we have time. Yeah. drifted away from social media and like I, I just want to be like I feel it, it is rough like I put out a book this year and I was so burnt out like I, I didn't think I would ever write a book again and like that idea of doing it just it's just it really gets you with all the like promotion but I just was really lucky and I did a artist residency for a month and there are many of these and of course you know you have to be in a <clears throat> like if you have kids it's hard, right? But like if you have even a week where you can have dedicated space away from other responsibilities, even a weekend, like going away somewhere and just remembering what it is to create, I think that's so important. And so everyone's got different circumstances in their life, but like it just you just need to give yourself that time away. It really worked for me. So I feel like cured right now. <laughs> but this year was rough. Subscribers have, yeah. I, I think it's. There's one. And here's another one. 
I think it's a larger conversation about who's actually subscribing to print media. And that is a larger conversation, and I think, oh God, this like needs to be its own panel. Something I think about a lot because technology, you know, technology is relevant. So uh, how do you summarize? Like, there are seismic changes in the way that. New Yorker stories and cartoons get disseminated that have to do with print media dying, right? So it's not just the subscribers, but it's the actual form and the sort of money and investment. And I, I think we can try to, I mean, social media has a lot of problems, but it does allow millions of people to see a cartoon that we draw. And there's different incentives on social media which are problematic, and I've written essays about this, but. Um, but I think we have to like, try to be hopeful about the fact that we're making amazing work and people want to see it. So I think like I think technology is helping helping people see our cartoons. You know, even though they have to look at a bunch of ads for yoga pants, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's take one more question. Is that okay? All right, wait, let's oh. here. Yes. Um, so. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. This was really nice.